Welcome to the Video Creators Podcast. We help YouTube creators grow their audience and business with next level tactics and strategies. Want to accelerate your channel's momentum, be more profitable, and change the lives of more people than ever before? You're in the right place. The Video Creators team has over a decade of experience providing YouTube strategy for brands like Disney, Warner Brothers, HBO, and even YouTube themselves. So far, our team is responsible for helping clients generate over 17 billion views on YouTube. And now, to help you, here's Tim, Lennon, and Delena. Hello, creators. How are you guys? Welcome back to another Video Creators Podcast episode where our goal is to give you next level tactics so that you can grow your YouTube audience, reach more people, and change their lives. And we're all busy. And there's a lot of great information out there, but there's also just a lot of information out there whenever it comes to growing on any social media platform and especially YouTube. I mean, how many podcast episodes do we have, you know? (laughs) Over 300. (laughs) And how many YouTube videos do we have? Over a thousand? Um, Yeah, I don't know how many. Yeah. So there's just so much information out there. And um, if whether you're just getting started on YouTube or you're trying to take your channel to the next level, then um, I wanted to just kind of narrow down just five specific things, like kind of just sift through all the information. If there were just five things that I needed to focus on that are really going to be the needle movers in my channel, what are those five things? And that's what I want to share with you today. But first, Tim, how are you? How's your... I'm doing How's okay. Week month going. Um. Yeah. Well, my month is starting over with me back here at Video Creators for this past week. So that's been that's been fun. Yeah. Things are going yeah. going well here. We had uh, an exciting event in our house um, recently. We had a mother give birth in our at apartment your house attached attached to our house. Yeah. So we put it on Airbnb oh. <laughs> and. Uh, this was not an Airbnb guest. We do put it on Airbnb, but there is a um, a lady who um, knew she was pregnant and that she didn't it was her first child. Didn't want to go to the hospital to have it, so they rented um, our apartment from us. And, and her midwife, they came and had it at our apartment as opposed to her house because of the state she lives in. Um, it's legal here, not there. So oh. they, yeah. So they so had the baby in our apartment and. She was in labor for a long time and we all, everyone like it shares a wall at our house on the other side of the wall. We're all like excited and like for this baby to come like, we can't believe it's going to happen in our house, you know? And so she labored for a long time and eventually we got the text messages because we couldn't hear anything. <laughs> it was just like, they had a baby girl. Awesome. And we're like, woohoo. Like, cause we, my wife and I, we have seven girls, right? They're really, really excited. Yeah. Or no, we have five girls, seven kids, five girls, two of them are boys. And so we're really excited for her. And then like 40 minutes later, they're like, surprise, there was another one in there. And we were like, how are they you surprised? Know? They did not know. They did not know that they were having twins. I know. So they didn't do any ultrasounds because they they were, they wanted to do things very natural and, and which is I respect that totally, but they didn't do any ultrasounds or anything. And so, and it's her first pregnancy. So she doesn't know what it feels like or anything. So they had, they yeah. had baby girl twins in there. They had, they delivered one. They thought they were like, okay, they start cleaning up. And then like her body didn't start recovering the way it was supposed to. And so the midwife was like, give me like whatever tool they used to check for a heart. And there's another heartbeat in there. They're like, oh, you're having oh. another one. <laughs> And so then um, 40 minutes later, they had a second girl, which really threw them off because they only had enough clothes for one. They only had one car seat, you know, for the, for the baby, which we have plenty of car seats here. So we just gave them one of ours because our kids have outgrown um, most of them. We still had some infant ones that hadn't expired yet. So we're like, you can just have this one. (laughs) But, um, but yeah, it was, it was a really exciting time here at our house. We were excited for them and just all the just yeah all that excitement was a lot for our kids and our whole family to be a part of and it was exciting so yeah wow what a story well i can't top that <laughs> <laughs> well, I, um, yeah it was it was good yeah. it was fun we were really excited how are you doing delana cool. uh, 
I'm, I'm good. Yeah. My, my, oh, you know what? Guess what? I got a personal trainer. Oh, like, like a fitness personal Just trainer? Saying. Yeah, I did because I have had a lot of fitness goals. I think everybody's had a fitness goal. You know what I'm saying? But, um, I always have one. I never reach of- it. <laughs> I've had a lot of fitness goals that I actually like working out. I like going to the gym, but I've had like a lot of personal health issues, especially over the past year, um, year or two ish that, um, have just been really deflating for me and made it extra complicated for me to like build muscle and stuff like that. And I started getting really overwhelmed about like, what I should eat to reach the goals that mm. I want to eat or, or mm. the, the goals I want to eat. The, uh, what <laughs> I, I have lots of goals of what I'd like goals. to eat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can't eat those um, anymore. I'm 41 wanna, years old. Yeah. Anyway. So, and then also I, I've had some past injuries that have made like certain workout. I have the scrawniest arms guys. I, I joke and I call them noodle arms because there's just like no muscle there. I definitely get it from my mom. And, um, but she even has better muscles than I do in her arms. And, um, but I have like some shoulder injuries anyways, all this stuff. I was getting super overwhelmed at the gym and just like what to eat to support my goals and all this stuff. And so I was like, you know what, I'm just going to bite the bullet and get somebody who like does this for a living that helps people do these things and helps people with their diet, even when it's complicated. And so, um, I talked to this guy and he was like, yeah, I'm going to put you with this one trainer who Mm. is like, he's really good with people who have particular diets or restrictions and, um, also great with people who've had past injuries that affect them. So I was like, perfect. So got my first session on Monday. I'm really excited about it. Is that in a local gym? Yeah. It's, a only like not, I don't think not even 10 minutes from where Mm. I live. So I'll be going there twice a week with the trainer. For now, eventually three times. I a should week. probably do something like that eventually. Right now, it's just me and Apple Fitness Plus, which I like, but I, I gotta, I gotta do more than that. Uh, so, whenever it comes Good for to you. fitness, though, it's like, it's like one of those things. It's like you have to want it. You know, you can't want to want it. You have to yeah. want it. You know what I'm saying? Yes. And so, yeah. like. Even if I know people who have gotten fitness trainers and it's kind of like a thing where they do it in hopes that it will like m- make them want it. But if you don't already want it, then the fitness trainer won't help you. That's true. Um, yeah. So I don't know how I got to a point where I wanted it, but eventually I did. So <laughs> <laughs> I can't oh, help good. you on I'm, that front. <laughs> I want it, but probably not the way you're describing it. I'm like, ah, but I also want to just sleep and not wake up really to work out. <laughs> oh, I'm not waking healthy up too, right? Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Oh yeah. See, that's my thing is that like, I will not wake up early. So I'm going in the afternoons and the evenings too. There you this go. Thing. For today's Creator Spotlight, I want to introduce you to Julian from the channel Eat the Blocks. He grew slowly for a few years, but his channel over the past year or so has really taken off, and now he has shot up to 100,000 subscribers. And not only is he now at a really great goal that many creators have, which is 100,000 subscribers, but he is making seven figures from that 100,000 subscribers, and That is, and he actually, in this conversation that he had with Tim, he explains exactly what he focused on to make seven figures from just 100,000 subscribers. Because there are creators that have 100,000 subscribers and they do not even make a livable income on that. So in order for him to make seven figures off of this is huge. And I want you guys to hear exactly what him and Tim talked about because I think it's super inspiring. Julian, it's been so fun to hang out with you here for the past hour and talk about your channel and your business. You, I I mean, today you hit 100,000 subscribers on your YouTube channel. So congratulations, man. It's so exciting. Um, Tell us a little bit about what your channel is about and what you do there. Yeah, yeah, I'm so excited to have finally reached this milestone. So my channel is to teach blockchain development. So it's for coder, Uh, it's, uh, it's very specific. Um, and yeah, I started in, uh, in 2017, 
Uh, and yeah, and here we are almost five years later, uh, 100,000. So uh, it took some time. Um, but I think what's important to, to realize is that it, it wasn't uh, linear. It, mm -hmm. it was ex exponential. So for a long time, it just grows slowly. Uh, but it doesn't mean that you will keep growing slowly uh, all the time because at some point something's going to happen and things will accelerate. And you took off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What uh, One of the things that's interesting about your channel is that you are not banking just on an AdSense advertising model. Of course, you have AdSense, you have sponsorships and things, but you're doing a lot with online courses and a membership program and things. Uh, and, and we'll maybe keep it generic and say that your channel is doing over, over seven figures a year with 100,000 subscribers. So what advice would you give to another creator who is like, hey, I have 100,000 subscribers <laughs> or whatever, like I'm not making seven figures a year. What advice would you give to that person who's trying to get to where you are? So I would try to see if it's possible to uh, increase the LTV. So the, the, the amount that you, the average amount that you sell per customer mm -hmm. and try to see like, if you not to focus on something a little bit too low level, uh, which has less value for, for the customer, uh, and instead, if, if you can try to address a, a higher level need, uh, example for me at the beginning, I was trying to sell my, my courses based on, on the technical knowledge. I will teach you the, uh, how to do X, Y, Z. But I changed this to, I will show you how you can become a six figure blockchain developer. And mm -hmm. this has much more value. Mm -hmm. So you're so you're focusing the sale more on the reward or the benefit that they want more so than on the on the how to the skill the tutorial level that they're trying to like the information they want to learn, and then uh, you said LTV uh, what I think is really important uh, lifetime value of the customer. How do you go about figuring out what that is? Because maybe some creators have never even heard of lifetime value of a customer. What is that, and how do I figure that out? Yeah, so it's, it's very simple. It's just on average, how much money uh, you get per customer. Uh, so you just uh, download all your sales um, and then you get, uh, basically you add all the all the sale, all the sale you made, you divide by the amount of customer and then, then you get your LTV. Yeah, simple. So you've been trying to pull different levers and try different things. You're like, hey, instead of one customer over the lifetime of being a customer with me, instead of them spending, let's say $250, how do I get that to $300? And not just by raising prices. We're not here like, let's figure out what the market will support necessarily, but offering more value or adding this program to them, this thing to the membership program or like what, what holds their attention, what provides more value to them that makes it feel may, makes them feel like I need to stick around longer. Is that, is that kind of what you've been doing? It's trying to pull different levers to see what, what increases the lifetime value there? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I also try to pay attention to the, the new need that arise. So in my industry, uh, there are a lot of new things. And so when I see something new that becomes popular and, and I know that a lot of people want to do this, then it gives me an ID for a course. So this will uh, increase the, the, the LTV. Um, but also for, for some people, um, so it's possible that some people chose the, the, the wrong uh, audience. Uh, and are mm. stuck. So there are people who have huge channel and they don't make any money at all because that kind yeah. of audience just will not buy anything. So you also have to ask yourself, like, did you just do a channel because that interests you, but is there actually nothing to sell? Uh, and if that's the case, it's fine. You still learn a lot by 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 doing this, but you have to you have to change something. Yeah. Yeah, I have friends who have a million and a half subscribers on YouTube and make around $600 a month, right? And I don't know in that in their case, in most cases, it's not like that their audience won't buy anything. I think most of them, they just haven't figured out what value they're providing for free on their content and then how to sell like 10X that value in a format they would be willing to pay for, right? They're just kind of like, well, I'm just making vlogs or I'm just playing games or I'm just, you know, doing this thing. And mostly in the entertainment space, and I think that, yeah, they just haven't identified the value proposition for their channel. And then it's really hard to know what to sell if you haven't identified that first. So, yeah, well, congratulations on your success and on your growth uh, on your channel. And thank you for letting us be a small part of that. If you guys want to check out Julian's channel, there's a link to it in the show notes down below this, this podcast episode. You can check it out and see what he's doing uh, to, to help blockchain developers get six figure income jobs.
It's so thrilling to see whenever creators that they just, they get their priorities right and they're like really hone in on their business model. And um, it's really clear that they're connecting with their audience in that way and serving people well because they're able to make seven figures off of just 100,000 subscribers. And I know that 100,000 subscribers is a big goal for some people, but it's also it's smaller whenever you think of like the grand scheme of YouTube and the big creators that are out there. And there are creators with like millions of subscribers that don't even make seven figures from their channels. And so it's, it's incredibly, it's, it's incredible. It's amazing. And it's totally doable. Um, and if you are somebody who's kind of struggling with, all right, well, my channel is growing, um, or you're even struggling to reach that hundred thousand milestone, then we would love to hop in a call with you. You can book a one hour call with us at videocreators.com slash consulting. Um, you could also book a call with Tim himself. If you are looking to kind of hone in on your business model a little bit more. That's what he specializes in. So um, you can also, if you do have that milestone and you're like, whoa, what is going on with the seven figures? Then Tim is the person to book a call with and you can do so there, videocreators.com slash consulting. I like that conversation with him because that entire call was about business development around his channel and he's got some really big goals for it. And I think he's going to hit them because he thinks he can, and now he's got a better path forward for actually reaching those. So I'm excited to see Mm -hmm. where Julian goes as he goes from two figures. I don't think it's unreasonable for him to like double his income in about a year. Uh, And that was what, like we had a conversation about like, what do I need to do? What needs to happen in order, in order to take this business model? I've taken as far as I can go. How do I take it to the next level? So I like having those conversations. It was, it was fun. So I'm rooting for him. He's going to get there. I mean, if he's already doing that with just 100,000 subscribers, gets 200,000, who knows? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the first point on this cheat sheet that I have for you, this let's narrow everything down to just a few simple things, the most effective needle movers for your YouTube channel. And the first one is to focus on thumbnails that really go after what your audience wants and or teases a story. So I know that there's kind of two different genres we can go after here. There's the educators that need to go after what their audience wants. Um, And then there's kind of the entertainers who uh, need to tease a story of some sort. However, I do kind of want to bring those two together in saying that if you are a creator on YouTube nowadays, most of us are entertainers now. Like that's just where YouTube is going. And I think most of us have have to accept that if we are a personality on social media, we are also entertainers. We're not just educators. And so uh, I want to kind of put that in with this because sometimes you are going to be like teasing certain information or teasing a reaction of some sort. Um, Even if you are an educator, those can be super, super powerful things. It can even be something as simple as teasing uh, that you give your opinion on uh, a a well-known figure's opinion. You know, like one of my clients recently, he did a, a video on how he made a seven figure income by not listening to Warren Buffett. So something like that, it's like, he's still being an educator. He is still, um, teaching people exactly what he does to make money and grow a passive income. But he did it by in in an entertaining way where it's kind of like, I'm not just like clicking on that for the information. I'm also clicking on it for the tension that you've given me in that thumbnail by telling me that you don't agree with Warren Buffett, one of the richest people on earth, you know what I'm saying? And so I think that's important that point kind of turned into something a little bit more than I intended it to, but I think that those two kind of go hand in hand. So the people that I watch on YouTube who are educators are definitely the ones who tell good stories around it. It, Like I very rarely will get really engaged with a piece of content is like, <clears throat> here's this thing you need to do. Um, let's take a woodworking video, for example. Here you got, here's mm-hmm. step one, do this, step two, step three, you know, I'm just kind of, and maybe if I watch it, it's because I'm searching for that video and I need to solve that problem with that tool right in front of me or something. But for the mm-hmm. most part, if I, I wouldn't come back and elect to watch that video again for fun. If it was on my homepage right. and I'm just browsing YouTube, I wouldn't click and watch it. The people that I, that I end up clicking watching are, are like the woodworkers and the homesteaders and the, the the people who are I'm learning stuff, but it's in the context of their story and what they're doing and the thing that they're trying to accomplish, the objectives, uh, the obstacles, the stakes for them. And I'm kind of just getting to a good story. By the end of it, I've learned something too. I've learned how to 
do this thing with the chickens or how to build a smokeless fire pit or, or something like that, that I never otherwise would even thought like, I didn't even know smokeless fire pits were a thing. But because I have an emotional attachment to this creator's story, I end up in, in a context where I'm still learning things from them. Like I know I'm going to learn something, but I click into it because I know I'm going to feel something too. And the best educators are the ones who marry those two things together, not just yeah. like, a, all right, step one, step two, step three, see ya. And then you they're yes. very, those types of videos are very forgettable. Yeah. I, I also think that um, on that note, the best educators are the ones who give you information that you didn't know that you needed um, mm. in the sense of like, they would lead with something like the Warren Buffett example that I gave I don't know what's in that video. You know, I don't know what he's going to talk about, you know, property investment, whatever he's going to talk about, about how he did it. But what I do know is that I'm curious about how he made money by not listening to um, this very famous person's advice. And so what, what does he have? Like he has some sort of information that I don't know what I don't know, you know? And I think that whenever they're able to do that by building intrigue, then, um, it, they are even better educators because now they've made you curious about something that you wouldn't have otherwise even known that you wanted or needed to know about this one subject. So focusing on thumbnails and titles that really go after what your audience wants or teases and, or teases a story or intrigue of some sort. The second point is, um, along the same note of thumbnails, Letting your thumbnail inform your title, actually. Now, what I'm not saying is your thumbnail informing your topic. That can be kind of a different discussion because we do recommend that you plan your title and your thumbnail beforehand. But what I mean by this is that so many creators just repeat what's in their title on their thumbnail and that's missed opportunity because first of all, um, you can use those two as like a power couple to give the most context to what is in your video. But then also, I think a lot of creators put a lot of focus focus on putting the perfect keywords into their um, titles and stuff like that. And they totally forget that the first thing that the viewer's eyes rests on is the thumbnail. And um, it's not the the title that they're going to read first. It's that thumbnail. And so letting the the context that you put in the thumbnail then inform what, what additional context is needed for the title or what additional context or intrigue can be added to the video that wasn't communicated in the thumbnail. So how can we put the most intrigue and the most important information to get the point across of what that video is about? and grab the viewer's attention in the thumbnail and then expand on that in the title rather than just repeating the two. Um, I don't know how many thumbnails my eyes have rested on where I saw the thumbnail and I was like, oh, that's interesting. And then I read the title and that bought me in because it gave me Mm -hmm. additional information about what the title had already, or I'm sorry, what the thumbnail had already teased. Yeah, I think it's also important to then use that to consider like what the opening seconds of the content are going to be. Because if you hit, if you create like really crazy amount of intrigue and tension in that viewer's, in that, that viewer's brain, so they click to relieve the tension. And then the opening seconds is like the punchline. <laughs> it's just like, Oh, I got it. And they're gone. Right. And you're going to, and they're going to, and they're going to leave. Uh, and so I, I think it's really important to determine what that title and thumbnail are before you even hit record so that you can then when you do hit record, know like this is what they saw. This is what they clicked on. This is the expectation they have. So what needs to be the opening seconds that they see next to make that viewer feel like, yes, I'm in the right spot. And, uh, yeah, that I, that I, I, it creates even more intrigue rather than just deflating it or starting talking about something else. And the thing in the title and thumbnail doesn't actually come to like minute eight, right? And then you've lost mm-hmm. that audience. They'll never, at first, a, a subscriber, a longtime viewer probably watch it because they don't even care what your titles and thumbnails are anymore if they have a strong enough connection with you. But a, a first time viewer, like that video is going to get go through your subscriber base and then go dead because it's not yeah. enticing to someone who's never heard of you before. And that if you want to grow, that needs to be the thing you really focus on are first time viewers in your analytics. Yes, yes, exactly. That's one of the things that I stress the most whenever I'm working with clients one on one is it's like, okay, you're getting average views right now, but you're, you're 
non-subscribe to subscribe viewer ratio, which is not a perfect metric to go by, but it gives a pretty close idea of like, if you have way more subscribers watching your content than non-subscribe viewers, that can be a problem because it is a problem because that means we're not reaching new audiences. And so what you're doing may be working for the pool of people that you have right now, but you're, um, you're either going to plateau or even eventually decline if, um, you aren't consistently reaching new yeah. viewers. You want a lot of first time viewers coming in, not keep, no, you mm-hmm. don't want to just keep subscribers engaged. There is a time and a place for that. And it's an important thing to do to keep mm-hmm. them engaged. But if the goal in, in this type of our, of our episode here, the cheat sheet for growing on YouTube in 2005, 2005, 2022, <laughs> then the goal, yeah, YouTube launched in 2005. So <laughs> then, then the goal for, for growth is non-subscribe viewers. So you really have that focus of title and thumbnail on someone who's never heard of you before and frankly doesn't even care who you are yet. The only reason they clicked mm-hmm. is because that title and thumbnail created some sort of curious, sparked some curiosity, wanted them to see what happens next, a little, maybe a little bit of disbelief or something that then got them to be like, oh, what happens next? And that's why the opening seconds of what happens after you've established that expectation is really important for continuing to hold that viewer's attention long enough so that they watch the content and then kind of be like, wow, this is a good video. And I kind of like this guy or I kind of like this girl, right? And that's what yeah. them will get them to watch another video and subscribe and and grow the channel. Number three, stop worrying about your keywords, guys. Come on. I know what you're trying to do here. And um, I know that YouTube, that there are even people out there that still preach that like YouTube is all about the SEO, SEO, SEO. And it's not. It's um, all about the AI. Uh, they, their AI is so sophisticated. Their AI knows every single word that you are saying in your video. Their AI knows, um, that this is a chair behind me right now. And that, um, if it had a logo on it, be able to tell me what kind, what brand of chair it is and everything in between. Like their AI is so sophisticated that they know what your video is about. You do not need to tell us what your video is about. What you need is to, focus solely on the two thing, two or three things we just talked about, which is to get them to click on the video. Whenever we're talking about our content reaching more people, the first thing that they need to do is click on that video. And so you trying different ways, different, uh, putting questions in your titles and your thumbnails versus, uh, putting statements and teasing a story or using well-known figures and all these different things that can, uh, inform the way that you even approach the topic from the beginning, but also, um, different ways that could intrigue your audience and get them to click on that video. Um, that's the first thing that you have to worry about. So stop worrying about what the perfect words that we need, or I'm sorry, the perfect like keywords in terms of SEO optimization, you should worry about the perfect words in terms of what intrigues your audience on the title and the thumbnail. Uh, But the keywords in terms of how people know and use keywords today are not important in whenever we're talking about YouTube. I was in a so. consultation with a creator trying to help them understand this. And, mm-hmm. and I just, I, so if you guys want to see this at work for yourself, just go to cloud.google.com slash video dash intelligence. That's where you can kind of see some of the AI at work. And, and, and that's a different product in terms of, uh, um, in ter- it's not a YouTube product. It's a Google product that w- the goal is you, you can just upload your massive amounts of video library here. They'll scan it and make it completely indexable and searchable for you because they are looking at every object. They know what brand sunglasses someone's wearing. They know they are identifying people and they'll associate like if you search for for um, video creators, they'll show you Tim Schmoyer, even though there's like no keyword correlation between those two. Right. Um, and so. All this crazy stuff, but I just wanted to show this one creator I was working with in a, in a one-on-one, one-hour session. Um, this is a quick version. So I went to cloud.google.com slash vision. And if you guys scroll halfway down the page, there's a, like a little widget. And you can just like click and drag any thumbnail image or any th- whatever on there. And it'll quickly scan it and then tell you like, here's what we think is happening just in this in this single frame. And when... I, I did that with this person. I'm like, I'm going to just grab something. And the only thing I had, I just had on my desktop 
um, I, I had posted this this uh, this quick uh, image in response to someone else of of um, Happy Gilmore. No, not Happy Gilmore. Um, what's the other one? Ah, my goodness. Tom Hanks in the movie Forrest Gump. There we go. And uh, and so he's like on the on the road, um, and he's like got the people coming behind him. There's like mountain range in the back. So I'm like, this is, that was the first image on my desktop. So I just grabbed it and I just put it on there. Oh, I'm sharing my screen. It scans it, and I didn't realize that even what YouTube will what their what their AI will even do is it scan the background, the horizon of of the mountain range in the background and then it geotagged that image saying like this is where it was and it, it right on the road that it happened like and i and i'm looking oh at it like God. through through the satellite view i'm like yep there's the there's the the mountain range right there so there is no keywords in that one frame about like uh, like where this would, but they scanned the mountain range and they knew like this is exactly where this image was taken so the fact, the idea that like Google, you're right. Google knows what our videos are about and they know the roll, tilt and pan of our heads. They, they're they getting really good at even uh, understanding the emotion on our faces. So it's uh, no amount of keyword stuffing can will help with any of that. Will help you reach more people. <laughs> Well, it will yeah. help YouTube understand what your content's about. Now, metadata still matters, and, and keywords matter, but not because the view, not because Google cares, but because the viewer probably is expecting to see something if they're searching. If they're searching for like Nike shoes, well, they're gonna expect to see the word Nike shoes in the title because that communicates to them like this is the value that you're looking for, not because it was a keyword match. Um, mm -hmm. And keywords matter even less if you're going after homepage or suggested traffic, which is what we focus on because that's where explosive growth comes from. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to go from like 2,000 subs a day to 39,000 subscribers per day, like we did with one client, that um, like 93% of that traffic was coming from the homepage, not from search. Just to create a level of intrigue and curiosity you can spark to get someone to click, that far outweighs any sort of keyword stuff. And I can give you lots of examples yeah. of that, but maybe ever we've already taken this point too far. I don't know. <laughs> You've had entire um, episodes about this too. So <laughs> yeah, we do. Yeah. So it's really important and we're going to keep, I feel like <laughs> video creators is like the, uh, the flagship for stop doing keywords, <laughs> stop doing SEO. Well, YouTube themselves has been doing that, saying that for a while, it's just that most people don't believe them because they don't have another framework through which to understand or think about their, how do we grow on YouTube? Our framework is mm -hmm. optimized for people, not robots. And we see that yeah. work hands down every single time it's done well. But if you don't have that framework or don't know how to implement that type of framework, you just go back to optimizing for robots and then you kind of just Mm -hmm. get stuck and you get a little frustrated and wonder why it's not working. And then people confuse correlation and causation thinking that they're growing because they yep. got the right keywords. But then I look at the content it's like, no, I have all sorts of questions when I see that thumbnail. <laughs> like what is that, yeah. that, that tension, that intrigue is what actually is making this work. And then look what you did in the opening seconds. That's why this is working. Not because we were keywords. So there you go. Yeah, I'll stop preaching. Uh, even creators that I watch that say like, hey, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe on my videos. It really does help my channel. And I just, I'm like, oh, I so wish that I could have a conversation with you and let you know that like, you don't have to just stress about that. It. You know what I'm yes. saying? Just, just yeah. don't do it for a few videos and see what happens. Oh, nothing? Perfect. Right. Okay. Yeah. I, I feel so, my heart just like goes out to them because I know that so many of them like stress about that. Oh, well, this video didn't go far because I didn't get enough likes on it. I need to get more like, you know, and, and it goes in this whole circle of this, like this rabbit hole that they totally don't have to go down uh, mentally or emotionally, you know, if you're a creator that's really emotionally invested in your work, um, I just, I feel, I like, I, I want to tell them like, no, yeah, you don't have to stress about that. <laughs> yeah. Just but make good just content. Just focus on the people. Yep. Yep. So number four, 
tell more stories, not just straightforward information, your story, your viewer's story, um, a made up story to get the point across. Who cares? Um, human connection through story is more and more where, um, YouTube is going because that's what people are responding to. I mean, if you spend any amount of time on TikTok. 90% of what you see on that platform is story driven. Um, I mean, I guess it depends on what you interact with, but for me and, and other, like my friends, my husband, stuff like, like all the stuff that I see is 90% like story driven, intrigue driven. It's not a uh, straightforward how to information. And if it is a straightforward how to information, it's like a really cool transformation that's happening from before and after a really cool hack of some sort, like it's really innovative. And so, um, you can have the exact same information that so many other educators have out there. But if you can wrap a, wrap it into a good story, even just good examples, I have clients that, that, um, they just use, they've used stick figures. They just make up little stories and they use stick figures and they draw it on a little whiteboard and they're like, okay, Sally is in this situation and Bob is in this situation and they're trying to get to this thing. And they come up with a whole little, uh, story arc just to teach something as simple as investing, you know, and at well, wash, <laughs> like investing is simple, That's but simple. Yeah. Um, yeah, <laughs> not simple, simple as but what to do I with mean, your life savings. <laughs> Yes. Sorry, um, not not simple, but like mon can be mundane, you know, and can be like, yeah. well, what story is in investing or what story is in spreadsheets or what story is in all of these things? Guys, there's a story. There's nearly always some sort of human emotion or and situations that happen around these things that are even seemingly mundane. Um, I love systems. I love building systems and particularly like productivity platform systems, project management systems. It's definitely one of my fortes. And, um, that and that's stuff, why you're COO. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And that, that stuff, I even know like that. So many creators could tell me that if they were doing the same things, they could tell me that like, what kind of story am I supposed to put into that? Um, and there's so many things where I could, I could give examples of like, Hey, if you're in this situation, if you're frustrated with this, this, and that, mm -hmm. then, uh, and you're trying to get to this thing over here. So we've got, who's the character? What do they want? They want to get to this thing over here. Then you need X, Y, and Z. And so just bringing a little bit of that humanness, that human experience into whatever it is that you're teaching is so important. And because becoming increasingly important if you want to compete with what's out there on YouTube nowadays. And so simple, just learning about storytelling. Storytelling is complex. You know, it's not an easy feat. I'm not here to tell you that it's easy, but I am here to tell you that you need it. And um, so Tim, I feel like you're really good at kind of like breaking down and just giving them like the basics of storytelling. Do you want to run through that really quick? Yeah. Um, I, I, before I do that though, I want to point out that like a story doesn't have to look a certain way. I think sometimes we think Hollywood, we think yeah. major motion picture films, we think like, um, and, and then that, and then we get hung up on how does this apply to my channel about taxes or spreadsheets? And, <laughs> and so we have, uh, I worked with one creator who has a drawing tutorial channel he was doing them around to 10,000 to 20,000 views per tutorial. And we talked about how to, how to integrate story. And so he's like, all right, well, let me try to tease a story that has this, this transformation that this, that my audience really wants in it. So he made a, a video called two beginners instantly improve how to draw what you see. So he normally would have been like how to draw what you see, but instead of he mm. had two beginners instantly improve that creates a little bit more curiosity and then the opening of the video, instead of like, okay, well, here's the problem, here's how you do it, like an info level thing. The story, it was only like a few sentences long. I just asked, I asked my wife and my friend Dan to draw this face. Neither, neither one of them draw. My wife told me that she just can't draw faces, which is a common thing to feel. Maybe you feel something similar. Yeah. That's it, right? It's just like a couple sentences and he's into the content and the rest of the tutorial was basically the same as we normally would have made. And But because the title and the thumbnail and the opening 
uh, created some emotion and some connection like, oh yeah, this is how it feels. You just can't draw. How do they instantly improve? That video, last time I checked it, it had 850,000 views <laughs> instead of like 10 to 20,000 views. Uh, and it also the thumbnails teasing the transformation the before and after as well. It makes you think like, what is the, how do they go from that to that and instantly? So the a, a story very quickly, we, again, we have full episodes about this too, but um, a story is like hero's journey, right? One, there's a character. Two, what do they want? Three, why can't they have what they want? The obstacles. Four, what's at stake if the character doesn't get what they want, which would be the stakes. Number five, who or what comes along and helps that character do what they couldn't do before. That would be the guide. Number six, how does a character ultimately get what they want? That would be like a climax. And then seven, how is how is the character transformed by this process? How did this how did overcoming these obstacles and, and overcoming these stakes actually make them different now than they were at the beginning of the story? Which sounds really complex, but you can do all of that in like uh, uh, like, like the woodwork, like a uh, friend at Brad, um, from, um, fix this, build that be like, instead of here's how to draw a dresser or how to draw a dresser, here's how to build this dresser. And just be like, my wife doesn't like this dresser in our room and she's out of town for the week. And I just wanted to know, like, could I surprise her and build this type of dresser that she really likes instead? I don't know. Let's go find out. It's a very different setup to the tutorial now. Now you're watching me like, what's her reaction going to be? When she comes home, she's going to love it. And he's, and he's showing her his mistakes. And he can't figure this one thing out. So he calls a guide, a friend of his, who teaches him how to do the epoxy uh, pour better so that it looks the way he wants it to. And at the end, it's not really about the dresser. I could build a dresser now, I, I learned. But at the end, it's really about the connection between him and his wife and that space being transformed and her attitude about their bedroom being transformed, right? So it's a, you can take just a simple tutorial and just with a few sentences up front, turns it into a very different emotional experience. Number five, Focus on keeping viewers on the platform longer. And especially since we just got done talking about educators, I know that you guys probably have businesses that you're trying to grow and it's tempting to take viewers, like tell them that they can sign up for your email list or where they can buy products or sign up for courses and things like that. But consistently ending a viewing session can be negative signals to YouTube and show that you are... Uh, that people are abandoning the platform after watching your content. And so we don't want too many of those signals. It's okay if they abandon your platform uh, or abandon the platform maybe like 25% of the time. So like 25% of your videos take them off of the platform. But we want to focus on extending the viewing session time because YouTube, a lot of creators talk about watch time, like how important watch time is. And then they tell uh, other creators that they need to, you know, get, make longer videos so that they can get more watch time because it's important to YouTube, but YouTube is not just measuring like in individual watch time. That's just this one video brings to their platform, but they're actually measuring the entire viewing session. So what I'm not saying whenever I say this is make longer videos. That's not what I'm saying. Um, what I am saying is that don't Keep in mind that YouTube does value keeping viewers on its platform. It's not the only thing that matters by any means, but um, they do, this can work in kind of a spider web effect because if you get really, really good at continuing the viewing session time, then there's two different ways that this works for you. One, it gets the viewer more connected to who you are. And, and this is where your storytelling uh, will play a big role in this because you can ask them to watch more videos of yours, but if your content just itself is not good, then it's not going to matter. So work on your storytelling first, but then you can make really, really specific calls to action at the end to get them to watch more of your content. So it could be something like, hey, um, if this video you know, brought up this issue or you've never done this thing that I talked about in this video, then make sure to watch this video right here where I actually go over that technique. And you can call to a very, very specific thing. And you can even point to it on your screen whenever you, or pretend like you're pointing to it on your screen whenever you are filming the video, because then whenever you point to it and you put the end screen actually on the video, then it'll pop up and it'll, you can place it right where you're pointing and then they know to click there, but you have to do it within the last 20 seconds of the video. But the reason why this is so powerful is I was just, I was actually with one of my clients recently and I pulled 
their data. And one of, that was one of the things that they were working on was making their ending super, super short and sweet so that they could quickly pitch another video to them. And they're just a vlog style channel. They're not doing a lot of educational content or anything like that. It can be even easier for educational content to do this. So they actually had the, um, harder side of this, which is to get people to click on more of their vlogs. And, they have been working on this. And so whenever I pulled their analytics recently, it showed just from their end screens of them working on this, it led to over 10,000 more views on their videos that mm. month. And just that alone, just them getting into, and that is like virtually no extra work that they had to do. They just had to change the language that they were using at the end of the video and uh, asking people to get more into their content. So if you are a small creator, and I know that sometimes it can feel like you're trying to get every view that you can get, you know, then this is great for you to get people into more of your content. But then especially as you grow and you get a bigger audience, you see the spider web effect of it reaching into, you've got all these videos that are pointing to each other and it's keeping viewers, not just on the platform longer, but on your content longer. So it serves you individually better because viewers are consuming more of your content, building more of a no like, and trust factor with you individually. And thus are more likely to come back, are more likely to sign up for your courses. If you're, if you're selling something, you know, um, it just works in a human way, um, in an algorithm way, which the algorithm is just the human, you know what I'm saying? Cause it's responding to the human. Um, and so focus on keeping the viewers on the platform longer. That can have such a big effect. I mean, over 10,000 more views just from end screens, just from end screens alone. Is no that just 10,000 so, clicks on the end screens? Because, or do those yeah. 10,000 then go watch even more after that, which I know you can't track, but yeah, you can't track. I mean, so that's could've... like just those clicks on the end just screen. The I can't, yeah. I can't see from there, you know, whether they, right. um, yeah, watch even more content. And I told that to the client, I was like, this is just the clicks that we're seeing on the end screen. This isn't like, Hey, did they go and watch, um, you know, once they got into that next video, did they watch a video and suggest it or click on another end screen after that? Like, we don't know that we can just see even the great results of 10,000 more views that month, you know? But you probably saw a lift on the home screen traffic too, because you get a bunch of people clicking on more end screens to go watch more content, then that's going to be, that's a really positive signal to YouTube. And they'd be more likely yep. to put more content on the homepage for that, which is the, yep. in my opinion, the best discovery sort, because like, like Hands Google down. and all the other ones, you got to go search for the content. But this is like YouTube just putting content in front of people when they're not even looking for it. So that's that's mm -hmm. what we that's why I like going after. But um, so yeah, so there's a there's a big ripple effect that comes from doing end screens really well, um, which obviously starts with getting someone to click and watch, and then capturing mm -hmm. their attention, holding their attention to the point where they feel something. They're like, I want more from this person. Yes, I want to click and go to that next video. And then when yeah. that happens, then YouTube figures out, oh, they want more from this person. Perfect. And then they're just going to follow that person around with that, with that creator's content and the suggested videos and the homepage and becomes this whole ripple effect of growth. So, yeah. Yeah. It can be so powerful. I mean, I think all of us have fallen into, uh, you know, the YouTube rabbit hole where it's like, we find we click on one video from the homepage and then we watch a few videos of that same creator from there. And then suddenly <laughs> that creator is being suggested to you for the next two weeks. You know what I'm saying? Because YouTube saw those strong signals that you were liking their content and they want you to be on their platform. And so they're going to suggest more of that content to you. So if we can kind of give YouTube those same signals through a way that we can have uh, an effect on, like just through simple, strong calls to action at the end of the video, super tangible and can have massive effect, like 10,000 more views that month, you know? So, um, yeah, really important. And even with these five points, if you guys still feel kind of overwhelmed, like, oh, within these five things, where do I start? I always tell creators, I'm like, start from the outside in. As funny as that sounds, I know most people say inside out. But what I mean by that is like, what is the first thing that viewers interact with? Interact with is the title and the thumbnail. And then what do they interact with from there? The first 30 seconds of the video. So then work on the first 30 seconds of the video. Then you've got the whole middle of the content, right? You can work on your stories, different editing styles, stuff like that. That's the next thing they're going to interact with. And then the 
the last thing they interact with is the end of the video, right? Assuming that they got to the end. And so then work on your calls to action, but work, like start where the viewer starts and work on that first and then work your way throughout their entire journey, basically, um, is I think the best way to start. Every week we like to give you a power tip, which is just something short and practical or um, a piece of information that we feel like is important for you to know as creators uh, creating on this platform, this platform we know called YouTube. And that is that they now have TikTok style. So if you spend any time on TikTok, I feel like TikTok is just becoming like a regular part of our YouTube conversations here. <laughs> but um, it is... It, if you've been, if you spend any time on TikTok, then you've seen probably whenever a creator is live, it has a little red or purple or pink ring, whatever it is around. I think it's a red ring around their profile image on TikTok. And now YouTube is doing the same thing. So whenever you go live, you can actually see when a creator is live. So if you're watching uh, a video of theirs, then and you scroll down to where their uh, little icon is, if there's a red ring around it, then it shows that they're live right now. And um, it's just we'll a cool little feature. We'll also have live like right on it too. It says live, yeah, so you know what that like means. Tiny little yeah. Live text, yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, it's just a, a cool feature that I think we should know about as creators, you know, that we can expect like, hey, whenever you, whenever I go live, you'll see it on my icon. Uh, you can tell it to your viewers, but um, it's also, I think it's a super helpful feature. It will help more people engage with your live streams because if you think about a lot of channels have usually like one to three top performing videos. And if you have a lot of your views coming in from those top performing videos, while people are watching that video, there'll be a little red ring while you're live and they can click on your icon and engage with your live stream from there. So because of that, you might even see an uptick in your uh, live stream engagement, which would be pretty cool. Thank you for joining us for another Video Creators Podcast episode. If you have any questions yourself, we actually have a link in the show notes or the, the description of this video where you can actually leave us a voice message. And uh, like last week, we just did a whole episode on responding to some of your questions and comments in those voice messages. And so if you have one that you would like us to respond to, then leave it there. Um, otherwise, we will see you in next week's episode. Bye.